chapter 17 is called Cutoffs and Stephen. These dry details are of importance in one particular. They give me an opportunity of introducing one of the Mississippi's oddest peculiarities, that of shortening its length from time to time. If you throw a long, pliant apple paring over your shoulder, it will pretty fairly shape itself into an average section of the Mississippi River. That is, the nine or ten hundred miles stretching from K Road, Illinois, southward to New Orleans. The same being wonderfully crooked with a brief straight bit here and there at wide intervals. The 200 mile stretch from Cairo northward to St. Louis is by no means so crooked that being a rocky country which the river cannot cut much. The river cuts the alluvial banks of the lower river into deep horseshoe curves, so deep indeed that in some places if you were to get ashore at one extremity of the horseshoe and walk across the neck half or three quarters of a mile, you could sit down and rest a couple of hours while your steamer was coming around the long elbow at a speed of ten miles an hour to take you aboard again. When the river is rising fast, some scoundrel whose plantation is back in the country and therefore of inferior value has only to watch his chance cut a little gutter across the narrow neck of land some dark night and turn the water into it and in a wonderfully short time a miracle has happened to wit the whole mississippi has taken possession of that little ditch and placed the countryman's plantation on its bank quadrupling its value and that other party's formerly valuable plantation finds itself way out yonder on a big island. The old water course around it will soon shoal up. Boats cannot approach within ten miles of it, and down goes its value to a fourth of its former worth. Watches are kept on those narrow necks at needful times, and if a man happens to be caught cutting a ditch across them, the chances are all against his ever having an opportunity to cut another ditch. Pray observe some of the effects of this ditching business. Once there was a neck opposite Port Hudson, Louisiana, which was only half a mile across in its narrowest place. You could walk across there in 15 minutes, but if you made the journey around the Cape on a raft, you traveled 35 miles to accomplish the same thing. In 1722, the river darted through that neck deserted its old bed, and thus shorted itself 35 miles. In the same way, it shorted itself 25 miles at Black Hawk Point in 1699. Below Red River Landing, Rakursi cutoff was made, 40 or 50 years ago, I think. This shortened the river 28 miles. In our day, if you traveled by river from the southernmost of these three cutoffs to the northernmost, you go only 70 miles. To do the same thing 176 years ago, one had to go 158 miles. Shortening of 88 miles in that tri trifling distance. At some forgotten time in the past, cutoffs were made above Vidalia, Louisiana, at Island 92, at Island 84, and at Hales Point. These shortened the river in an aggregate of 77 miles. Since my own day on the Mississippi, cutoffs have been made at Hurricane Island, at Island 100, at Napoleon, Arkansas, and at Walnut Bend and Council Bend. These shortened the river in an aggregate of 67 miles. In my own time, a cutoff was made at American Bend, which shortened the river 10 miles or more. Therefore, the Mississippi between Cairo and New Orleans was 1,215 miles long 176 years ago. It was 1,180 after the cutoff in 1722. It was 1,040 after the American Bend cutoff, and it lost 67 miles since. Consequently, its length is only 973 miles at present. Now, if I wanted to be one of those ponderous scientific people and led on to prove that 
what had occurred in the remote past by what had occurred in a given time in the recent past, or what will occur in the far future by what has occurred in late years, what an opportunity is here. Geology never had such a chance, nor such exact data to argue from, nor development of species either. Glacial epochs are great things, but they are vague, vague. Please observe, in the space of 176 years, the lower Mississippi has shortened itself 242 miles. That is an average of a trifle over one mile and a third per year. Therefore, any calm person who is not blind or idiotic can see that the old Olithic Silurian period, just a million years ago next November, the lower Mississippi River was upwards of 1,300,000 miles long and stuck out over the Gulf of Mexico like a fishing rod. And by the same token, any person can see that 742 years from now, the lower Mississippi will be only a mile and three quarters long, and Cairo and New Orleans will have joined their streets together and be plodding comfortably along under a single mayor and a mutual board of aldermen. There's something fascinating about science. One gets such wholesale returns of conjecture out of such a trifling investment of facts. <laughs> when the water begins to flow through one of those ditches I have been speaking of, it is time for the people thereabouts to move. The water cleaves the banks away like a knife. By the time the ditch has become 12 or 15 feet wide, the calamity is as good as accomplished, for no power on earth can stop it now. When the width has reached a hundred yards, the banks begin to peel off in slices half an acre wide. The current flowing around the bend traveled formerly only five miles an hour. Now it's tremendously increased by the shortening of the distance. I was on board the first boat that tried to go through the cutoff at American Bend, but we did not get through. It was towards midnight, and a wild night it was thunder, lightning, and torrents of rain. It was estimated that the current in the cutoff was making about 15 or 20 miles an hour. 12 or 13 was the best our boat could do, even in tolerably slack water. Therefore, perhaps we were foolish to try the cutoff. However, Mr. Brown was ambitious, and he kept on trying. The eddy running up the bank and under the point was about as swift as the current out in the middle. So we'd go flying up the shore like a lightning express train, get on a big head of steam, and stand up for a surge when we struck that current that was whirling by the point. But all our preparations were useless. The instant that current hit us, it spun us around like a top. The water deluged the forecastle, and the boat careened so far over that one could hardly keep his feet. The next instant, we were way down the river, clawing with might and main to keep out of the woods. We tried the experiment four times. I stood on the forecastle companionway to see. It was astonishing to observe how suddenly the boat would spin around and turn tail the moment she emerged from the eddy and the current struck her nose. The sounding concussion and the quivering would have been about the same as she come full speed against the sandbank. Under the lightning flashes, one could see the plantation cabins and a goodly acres tumble into the river. And the crash they made was not a bad effort at thunder. Once when we spun around, we missed a house by about 20 feet that had a light burning in the window. And in the same instant, that house went overboard. Nobody could stay on the forecastle. The water swept across it in a torrent every time we plunged to thwart the current. At the end of our fourth effort, we brought up in the woods two miles below the cutoff. All the country there was overflowed, of course. A day or two later, the cutoff was three-quarters of a mile wide, and boats passed up through it without much difficulty, and so saved ten miles. The old Rakursi cutoff reduced the river's length 28 miles. There used to be a tradition connected with it. It was said that a boat came along there in the night 
went around the enormous elbow the usual way, the pilots not knowing that the cutoff had been made. It was a grisly, hideous night, and all shapes were vague and distorted. The old Ben had already begun to fill up, and the boat got to running away from mysterious reefs and occasionally hitting one. The perplexed pilots fell to swearing and finally uttered the entirely unnecessary wish that they might never get out of that place. As always happens in such cases, that particular prayer was answered and the others neglected. So to this day that phantom steamer is still butting around in that deserted river trying to find her way out. More than one grave watchman has sworn to me that on drizzly dismal nights he has glanced fearfully down that forgotten river as he passed the head of the island and seen the faint glow of the specter steamer's lights drifting through the distant gloom and heard the muffled cough of her escape pipes and the plaintive cry of her leadsman.